So can you see the slides now in large? Perfectly yeah. from here, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And um, this uh, lecture has uh, the name, formal name, water use and management slash cleaner production. And what I will show here during these next 30 minutes, that is uh, a short version of this lecture. The longer one will be put on the, the homepage for uh, later consultation if you're interested. And please go in and see there because there will be much more information on that. And then to start, so um, I would like to show you a picture of how in Sweden we look at the development of uh, uh, environmental management over the years since the Industrial Revolution. And if you have, have on one axis the degree of systems thinking, and then on the other axis the time. So we can see that we started uh, with simple waste dumping. We just physically removed solid, liquid and other waste from uh, densely populated areas. From around 1960, we started to discuss uh, waste disposal, external treatment, and so on. How could we have end of pipe treatment of the negative effects of uh, waste and wastewater discharges? And then in the 1980s, quickly from the start of environmental awareness, we got waste minimization. It is easier to reduce by source. So to minimize waste and recycle, that became popular in the discussion. And then it is important to uh, remember that practice always comes uh, behind so that these things. And we can also then uh, clearly say that if we are looking at the world in general, so still the most uh, dominant uh, method of waste uh, management, that is simply waste dumping. I would uh, argue that uh, around 80 to 90 percent of all waste in the world is simply dumped uh, even today. Sustainable development became popular after 1987. And then in the later years, we have got four I am mentioning here, industrial ecology that was first named in 1989. And that is my, so to say, uh, discipline in science. Cleaner production came around 1990. Then clean tech came above that as something more uh, broader approach than clean the production. And nowadays we are, the buzzwords actually is circular economy. It is very interesting to see how the phrase, the semantics changed with time. When I was uh, trying to update my presentation for today, I could see that there is actually very little uh, research papers with uh, in titles of cleaner production and clean tech after 2010, 2015. So now most of the discussion is around industrial ecology, circular economy, and uh, so on. So circular economy is perhaps the most, what is a predominant um, word that is used or expression now uh, in these days. Now we can see, now my does not mow my, my picture. Why is this? Mm. This is the same we have had before, isn't it so? Uh, well, now yes. It's the same. Ah, okay, here it comes. Got Very good. Name. So here we can see a paradigm shift in ecologic thinking that is now rapidly uh, coming up in uh, there. And I found this. So we could start that uh, early days, if we compare with the first uh, picture, it was fighting symptoms. And then later then it was subsystems optimization. And that means that we have uh, distinct emissions of different kinds and we try to fix them uh, in other ways. And then at the end, so we got system optimization and we see uh, we are now right in that phase. And then for the future, even more important, that global system optimization. So, and the most predominant, what we could call uh, thinking here is around the climate. We cannot get around that whatever we do. So we do it for uh, the global uh, what is atmospheric systems with... Uh, uh, climate emissions. So actually we are really on the same uh, boat, on the same spaceship Earth. 
material flows now an eco cycle. This is just to give you a, a mental picture. And this picture I um, uh, would like to acknowledge Lennart Nilsson, who in a program we had jointly. So he, we developed this thing and he made this circle. That if we look at society now, we can say that we have a very large uh, what is the amount of inflows into society. We have a small degree of recycling and we have a lot of final waste that is predominantly just, just dumped in the environment or stocked in different piles. Typically they are stocked in uh, so-called waste uh, uh, dumps in poor countries where people the, put uh, apart different types of products from the rich countries. So it's a, in many ways a very sad story. We have high material use and low degree of recycling. While in the future, we want to reach to another step where we have a much, much smaller, but not zero, that will not be possible. And a high degree of recycling. And that means that we will have also a low production of surplus uh, raw, um, rest products and waste. The life cycle perspective. That is something that ha has started in only, we can say 30 years ago, early 1990s. And it's uh, uh, the CETAC that has been working a lot uh, between um, uh, how to develop the life cycle thinking and life cycle assessment. And uh, one of my colleagues actually in Stockholm, Lars Gunnar Lindfors, he was one uh, of the first uh, persons in the world writing an article and developing a system for life cycle assessment. If we look here, so we can see that we look at a broad system that is a clean tech system boundary that both is taking care of the upstream system of the core system and of the downstream system. And then the cleaner production system boundary that is around the core system, which could be a certain activity uh, by uh, humans. And where we have inflows of uh, materials and energy, we have uh, production of uh, uh, products and diff waste and emissions. And then in the life cycle perspective, so we need to acknowledge both that we have upstream uh, system and a downstream system. And we can here connect to uh, a real uh, thing. For example, in Sweden, if we buy a TV set for our homes, so when we use it in Sweden, so it will only consume electricity and the electricity, it has uh, certain uh, consequences for the environment. But to start with, it has been produced in China or South Korea or Taiwan or uh, typically in Southeast Asia, where they have uh, a lot of, of um, energy based on, for example, coal which is highly uh, influential on uh, the atmosphere. So our consumption of the TV, looking at TV in Sweden, it is connected to emissions in Southeast Asia. And then when the TV is out, so typically it can go to an African um, uh, country and where it is disassembled into different parts and parts go back to recycle and parts are being dumped in, in this African country. And that is the downstream system causing also uh, different types of toxics and also uh, emissions. And to understand the consequences of the consumption in Sweden, looking at the TV set, so we need to consider everything. And very, very roughly one can say that if you have um, something consumed in Sweden, we would at least put twice as much environmental impact in the life cycle perspective as in the core system. Therefore, we need to uh, actually consider the whole system, the life cycle perspective. It is one thing to, that is very important to remember, and that is that if everyone is doing this in the life cycle perspective, then we do a lot of double accounting. And this is not, I think, enough, uh, what do you say, considered and discussed. So typically for the future, I think we will have to have different columns, so to say. One column would be the core system where you really have the permissions and the consequences that are coming 
in the local context for what is going on. And then the other columns for the upstream system and for the downstream system, so that you can also negotiate with other partners that are involved in the whole consumption system. Here we're going to fresh water. So here is a, another angle of what has been shown in several previous uh, presentations in this course. But I would like to make an argument here, and that's why I'm showing this picture, that since 1900, uh, the global water use has increased eight times. And that's why we see that uh, water shortage probably uh, will become the first really, really limiting factor for the global society. And that means that everyone will have to consider more in depth the use of water, how it is connected to the production of goods and services. If we then uh, see this and uh, take it from three countries and we compare here Uzbekistan, United States and Sweden, then there are many numbers that you can go back to and, and look afterwards, but I will point out four. The first is the total withdrawal of water in the three countries. And then we can see here that by far the largest is in the United States. Then Uzbekistan is high, but uh, very much lower than in the United States in total, and it's much higher both of them than in Sweden. If we then look at the population in the three countries, we can see Sweden is a little bit more than 10 million. Uzbekistan is 32 here, but say around 35, while uh, the United States is over 300. So then if we look at the uh, agricultural water, we can compare here and see that in Uzbekistan, it is almost it's dominating totally. And it's also in the United States, but not as much as in Sweden. And then if we look per capita, so uh, I think it's uh, fair to say that Uzbekistan is one of the leading countries in the world in water use per capita. And that is in a country that has very scarce water resources. Essentially, you have the rivers from the Himalayan mountains and you have groundwater. So it is so that one cannot really plan for the same types of industrial and social water use in different countries. We are very lucky, for example, in Northern Europe in comparison to both United States and to Uzbekistan. So we have different, what do you say, possibilities and we need to adapt to these situations in respective countries. Some examples of water saving measures. And again, to start with that, one of the things that one can do is always to be aware of how much water do we actually use. And that was the two uh, previous slides that tried to show that. We need to monitor water use carefully. We need also, of course, to put a price uh, on it. Install valves to close water when not used. I must say, and this is not what you say accusation, but it is an observation. I have been to over 60 countries in the world. In no country I have seen so much waste of water, leaking faucets, leaking toilets, water standing, running through the streets in the city and so on. And I think this is the first thing I would say that it is so important in Uzbekistan. You need to, uh, to take care of this unnecessary losses of water in, in the system because it is really not the way it should be as I saw it in the Uzwater project. And this is actually low hanging fruits. We don't need much investment. We simply need to be aware of that this is important and we can do it uh, almost uh, momentarily. Reuse of wastewater, downclassing of water that has been discussed in my country and in many other countries for decades, even centuries but very little adopted yet. In Sweden, we use drinking water for all kinds of things, which is really in one way horrible that we don't uh, adapt the uses of water to the needs uh, of, of the quality needs of the water. Recirculate cooling water after cooling, closed cooling water system. That's uh, pretty often uh, used, but could be used much more. 
install recirculation of process water after specific purification. Also, um, what do you say, established technology, but not at all used as much uh, as um, could, uh, it could be. And then redesign of processes. So here we can see some a priority list where at the bottom we have the most profound changes and we have the what's the most low hanging fruits to start with. This is to show something that is really about uh, one can say life cycle thinking and to see what is going on. This is a picture of a Swedish pulp and paper mill in the winter time and wood that is coming into a pulp and paper mill, it contains approximately 50% water and a lot of it is in, uh, then evaporated. So here it is obvious that there are water losses in this, but we have an excess of water, so it's not a real problem. But still you can see uh, how much it is. If we go to a field in Uzbekistan, it can look like this. It looks like there are no losses of water to the atmosphere. But we all know now from what has happened to the Aral Sea that uh, th here there is a lot of water, much more than from the, uh, what the uh, Swedish pulp and paper factory that is lost uh, during the evaporation. Then I think we should all be very interested in what Rustam showed us last time in his lecture, whether there are also other partial uh, explanations to uh, what has happened with the uh, Aral Sea. Now coming into cleaner production and here now this is much shorter than it was last year since I have only 30 minutes to go. And cleaner production is something that has been fostered very much by the United Nations Economic Environmental Program. So I'm using their definition here. And that what it actually means that it's a continuous, what is a improvement process where you use integrated preventative and environmental strategy to processes, products, services to increase eco-efficiency. So it means that we should produce more from less. Otherwise we cannot continue to grow uh, economically. And we are still far away from that goal that we should not in total uh, increase the impacts on the environment. And here what it also says that it is not something that it is a goal, it is actually a journey. It is this continuous improvement of the situation at hand. And the priorities here, uh, that is something that I've not really seen, but this we developed in a program where I took part in many years ago in Bolivia where we saw very, very rudimentary approaches to environmental management and cleaner production. And when uh, we saw this, so we said that you actually need, when you start from, uh, so say the beginning, to set priorities. And then we said that the first priority, it must be health aspect for the workers. And the second here, we put process accident risk because that's also involved to the uh, personnel that are working in the activity. And then uh, third, risks for local environmental impact, for regional environmental impact, and then priority five, risk for global environmental impact. Now we know that we have partially have another discussion because of the global climate impact and the situation. So we need to consider more or less everything at the same time. Still, I think that people like myself in rich countries, we need to understand that uh, we would still set that health and accident risks are of absolutely first, uh, what do you say, priority, because we, we care more for humans actually in the short term than for the climate. Basic approaches to cleaner production. And here we're coming back to a similar approach as with water, low hanging fruits, the things I can do today. 
I mean, uh, when we see, for example, in industrial processes a few years ago, where there was an excess of water available or no price, price on water, so water faucets could be opened, you clean the water, the floors in, in industries with um, open hoses in, in the, the tubings, and it was not, not actually in any housekeeping at all. To monitor and control, that comes also very early in this. Input substitution is very important. Can I use a less uh, toxic raw material and uh, improve the quality of the effluent? Even if I not, cannot reduce the water use, I can uh, reduce its toxicity. In situ at place of the recycling, water and chemicals. In the pulp and paper industry, it is a marvel that has happened in the last 50 years at least you could say in Scandinavia, to see that uh, pulp and paper industry is now almost uh, pollutant free. Technological optimization, that is to modify the, the processes. The redesign of the product. Here we can see, for example, that uh, historically cotton is very common. Nowadays, you can say that if you compare and you, you make textiles from, for example, viscose that is uh, produced from wood, you can drastically reduce both toxicity, water use and so on in the production of these things. But you need, of course, to find places where it should be produced on earth and so on. So here we also can talk about that you need to adapt the industrial development to the specific country, to the specific area. It's not so that you always can do the same things in all places. And then off-site recycling, when you cannot do it at uh, the same place. And that means we can see for aluminum cans or for paper. If we see in Europe, we have a European water uh, or a paper cycle or actually cellulose fiber that Sweden, Finland, we produce most of uh, the cellulose fibers for the whole European Union. And we export primary paper and primary fiber. And then the fibers are recycled in uh, paper recycling factories in countries like uh, Germany, France, England, Spain, and so on. So 80% of the raw cellulose fibers, they actually come from uh, the, the northern countries. And similarly, I think in Central Asia, one can discuss that fibers, both for paper and for clothing, textiles, it could come from the mountains and then it'd be recycled in the more uh, areas that are drier. Uh, the cleaner production project. One needs, of course, to either identify that there is an issue so that someone has to raise it. And of course, if the management can do that, it is preferable. At least it is very important to have the decision taking and the adoption of the management that they involve in the thing. Otherwise, it will only be so-called greenwashing. Cleaner production, they need to establish a certain group of different qualifications. Uh, people with different uh, qualifications, both technicians, systems thinkers, um, you could say water and uh, waste experts and economists. Mass and energy balances, uh, chemical engineering mass and LNG balance, they are extremely important in order to understand the metabolism of industrial processes. Improvement alternative selected. And then a feasibility of alternatives. So here the economy comes in to adjust the ideas by the technologies. And then selection of preferred alternative, that's the implementation. And finally, and not the least, project evaluation. Very often we do a lot of the first, but then we're happy when we have really implemented the project and we forget to evaluate it. So we learn for the future how to further improve it because we are only at the beginning of this journey of decreasing the physical resource metabolism of our human activities. Uh, the necessity to integrate uh, auditing, monitoring and practical measures. And then it's the two things. Uh, early processes, they are very often batch 
uh, processes or open processes. And that means that it is very difficult to interfere with them if you would like to change them. So uh, the continuous processes are much more uh, suitable for to work with that. So in some cases, it is not uh, enough actually to improve. You need to change approach to uh, produce something, a product or a service. But if they are continuous, you can apply cleaner production measures. And then we have the uh, balances. And the first step, of course, is to get an entire balance for the entire process. And here again, I would like to refer to the two pictures of the Swedish pulp and paper mill and of the, the, the uh, Uzbekistan field. And then when you can see that here in our minds, we can see that we should include the water that is uh, uh, evaporated from the pulp and paper mill, but we cannot see the water evaporating from the field, but it belongs to the mass and energy balance. And after this, it comes to balances for the most important sub processes in uh, the whole. And here we can see it uh, in detail. That here we have the, the uh, whole process. And then we are coming to the details. So here we have five sub processes. And in the same way, you are establishing for energy, air, water, solid waste, atmospheric emissions, and liquid emissions. And in this way, it must be that you come up with a result that it is uh, sub process number three that is the most feasible to work with in the first step. And then you wait with the others, and then you take them like fruit after fruit. Industrial ecology, lastly. Now I have only a couple of minutes left and I will talk one minute with industrial ecology and one with circular economy. So here, industrial ecology, that is actually something that I would call more and more that it should be regarded as a sub part of uh, ecology. That there is no meaning anymore to discuss that we have our humans, our activities, and then we have, so to say, the environment which means that it's something out of ourselves. We are all integrated into what is going in in the biosystems of, of the world. And industrial ecology, I argue, is on its way to look at the world in this way, that humans and human activities, they are part of something much bigger, much greater also philosophically. And we need to understand this. I argue that the economists of the world, they only care about us humans. And they have been coming like uh, the environment or the ecological systems. They are only like a backpack that you need to get, uh, uh, what do you say, light enough. But it's not that light. We are part of the ecosystems. So here you can see there is one early one from 1994 that is pretty good. It talks about the flows and materials and energy. It should also be the stocks in industrial and consumer activities and how to handle it of economic, political and regulatory uh, approaches. And then the second that perhaps is now more famous that is by uh, Gretel and Allenby, uh, two Americans. They talk about technological organism and that is our activities as humans when we interfere with the ecosystems. So we're talking about the use of resources, the potential environmental impact and the way in which they, uh, their interactions with the surrounding systems can uh, be made more sustainable. So that is a very, very, very interesting and now emerging field of research. Circular economy is the thing where I feel that more and more we are linking the physical resource management to the economy. And the wording here is the, the power of it. The circular economy, it is based on three main principles according to this definition. Eliminate, eliminate waste and pollution. Circulate products and materials at their highest value. That is very important in our current economy and then regenerate nature, I would say understand eco principles and work from there. And it is underpinned by a transition to renewable energy and materials. A circular economy decouples economic activity from the consumption of finite resources. And it means a resilient system that is good for business people and for the environment. 
at least a step forward. And now the, one can see that, um, for example, scientific article in this area, it is exploding really. So it is becoming the new buzzword word, you could say, for how to integrate uh, ecology with economy. And so with this, uh, I have finished and uh, I have two questions for the break. And the first one is, why is it so important to adopt a life cycle perspective on physical resource metabolism of human activities? And then you could also uh, compare with the two pictures I uh, showed you. And then the second question is, what main conclusions can be drawn from the water uh, withdrawal uh, numbers presented for Uzbekistan, USA and Sweden? What would you conclude from, from uh, those, uh, that figures? So thank you very much. And I finish here. Thank you, Björn. This was perfect on time, by second practically. <laughs> and <clears throat> so thank you so much. And let this slide stay for a while. So uh, because I know from experience that it's um, often forgotten of 10 minutes. What is really, uh, what actually was, were the questions. <clears throat> So now everyone remember these things, life cycle, approach to the world, to your life and so on. You have to think of upstream and, and downstream and so on. And uh, think very much about water in Uzbekistan, the most um, terrible example of how to not take care of the water properly. Um, so, of course, what Björn did not say that I have to add here is that uh, to make people be more careful with water, one needs to put the price on it. It has to cost something. That's a very strong experience from our countries here. Okay, so um, I will um, ask you to come back with your uh, points of view here in 10 minutes. So now there is a break. Thank you very much, Björn. Mm -hmm. Then, um, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, uh, the first part uh, was, I mean, we, we share with uh, my colleague uh, Ben Frostel, and the general title is Water Use and Management, Cleaner Production. And uh, mm, I am representing Samarkand's Architectural and Civil Engineering Institute, and uh, uh, I am a water expert, and uh, uh, my presentation will be mostly about water using. And, uh, and my, the, my lesson will focus on uh, water using in Uzbekistan, and it is somehow related to the uh, sustainability in the RLC area. And that's why I start with, uh, with the location. And um, probably you see, even I don't know half or the full screen, and it shows how the region, you know, the located and the world map and um, no, we, we, know, uh, we only see the first slide. We only see the first slide now. First slide in my slides are not moving. It's not moving. How to do that? Well, there, now we see the map. Yes. The oh, third, okay. your, we see your third slide. Your third slide, we see. Okay, then the second slide was in, like in the world map. So yeah, the yes, world yes. Map. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, this slide, you know, it gives a picture, you know, the, how uh, the region, you know, the um, located and uh, uh, surrounded by, by the countries and by the uh, oceans and also it goes, you know, the uh, deeper uh, to the, for example, to the uh, to Uzbekistan, and uh, <clears throat> on this map, on this uh, slide, you see how uh, the Aral Sea uh, uh, basin uh, 
is uh, located on between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, and also the basin, the mainly mainly uh, located in on the uh, two countries, but still we share uh, with the other neighboring countries, all other uh, Central Asian, and including Afghanistan, and we share. Uh, not only water. We share in other natural resources like air and uh, somehow we share, you know, the uh, flora and fauna and, and this is the, the main factors of the uh, sustainable development. But as we started with the water, so the main focus will be with the the main water sources for the Central Asia, it is, uh, you know, the Sardaria and Amodaria. And um, on this slide, you see the Uzbekistan's location is in the uh, middle of Central Asia. So Uzbekistan is a landlocked country. So it means uh, this country is uh, surrounded by the um, uh, I mean, Uzbekistan is a double, I'm sorry, double landlocked country, and it is surrounded by the landlocked countries. And it makes, you know, the, some extra uh, water issues in, in Uzbekistan and also neighboring Central Asian countries. And our institute, uh, you know, do we do some kind of um, Water resource, water research, and uh, we we'll, we we'll prepare uh, water experts for uh, Uzbekistan and other Central Asian countries. Let me just very quickly, very quickly introduce to you about my university, and it is uh, established by 1966. It, it is not too old university, but we we'll have. Um, water supply and uh, wastewater and water resources protection department. We will uh, train, uh, you know, the water experts on the bachelor, master and doctoral level. And we have, um, oh, uh, sorry, sorry. And um, uh, I believe, you know, that my colleagues, uh, uh, Lash Redden and Don Frostel and other our uh, project partners from other countries and from other regions, they have been in our department. And um, we are like a part of Uzwater project. And now uh, I think by this, uh, online course, we are moving, uh, you know, the further, I mean, I don't think it is not too fast, but still, uh, because of that project, we have a very good uh, connection, and uh, this online course uh, is uh, started, and uh, we are very grateful to our colleagues in Sweden, like uh, Swedish Aralsi Society, and uh, personally, you know, the Lars Ridden, uh, Don uh, Frostel, and other colleagues. And then, okay, uh, let's uh, move, and I will go now uh, deeper with the uh, Uzbek uh, Wilayats. This is Uzbek uh, regions. Uh, as you see on this map, uh, and the map shows, you know, the, uh, we can divide this, you know, the locations into three specific locations. And you see this part, and we call this uh, Fergana Valley, three regions. There are uh, Fergana, Andijan, and uh, Namangan uh, regions, and there are... Um, uh, located by uh, or divided by the mountains from the other parts of Uzbekistan. And um, 
and also water uh, situation is different uh, because you see they use uh, both from uh, Sardaria and Amudaria, but mainly from Sardaria basin. And uh, if we move um, further to the to the central part of Uzbekistan, we is Tashkent, Samarkand, and uh, Kashkadaria, Sokhandaria, and Bukhara, Navai regions. And you see the uh, this central region uses mainly water from Amudarya Basin and also uh, the Rafshan River and other small rivers, but uh, the big rivers which uh, feed the Aral Sea, uh, Amudarya. And uh, the northern part, of course, Karakal Park Republic and uh, Khorazm uh, region, and they uh, use only Amudarya water and uh, their location just next to the Aral Sea makes a lot of uh, not only water issues and also uh, social and other air pollution issues, health issues and, and other uh, uh, water related or uh, ecology, uh, environmental uh, issues in this region. And then, um, uh, why this problems? Of course, in the, uh, the first part you have seen, uh, Bern showed us how we use water for, for example, for uh, 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 cotton irrigation. It is just open irrigation and we use a lot of water and the water uh, withdrawal is uh, one of the biggest in, in the world uh, because of agriculture. And because, uh, not only because of agriculture and because of also climate. And now I am going to a little bit more about geography and industry and the climate. If you see on this slide, the slide shows uh, our biggest industry is agriculture, mainly cotton. Of course, now we are changing this. And the next one is automobile industry and uh, the mining industry and the metallurgy industry. So, and of course we have another industries, but uh, the main industries, they uh, use a uh, huge, of water for this production. And um, a little bit, uh, this is a general uh, information and uh, this information shows us uh, uh, how big is area and how many population we have. And, and of course, um, with whom was, uh, we share or how big, and I am just, uh, comparing with the state of Florida and the U.S., like uh, uh, it is two and a half size of the Florida state. I mean, Uzbekistan. Uh, still, we have you know the usual land, but geography is uh, totally different from other Central Asian countries. And uh, as I mentioned before, Uzbekistan is a double landlocked country and uh, we have no way to the ocean. And uh, it, what it means, it means uh, water resources are very limited. But you have seen in the previous uh, slide, you will have you know, almost uh, 36 uh, million population and uh, as a population number is uh, rising, it means uh, uh, it is the number of consumers and it is number of uh, economy, uh, it is number of uh, water uh, using is rising also. And you see the geography, also we divide into three zones and uh, desert zone, and uh, the valleys and also mountain areas. And the mainly uh, our region, you know, the, it is like uh, 
desert zone uh, and uh, irrigation is very important and the land is uh, of course land is uh, good for uh, for the industries agriculture but uh, the water uh, element and the climate is important and uh, this slide shows how uh, uzbekistan's climate looks like and uh, you see we have a longer and a very hot and dry summer period in uzbekistan and our uh, winter is becoming shorter and we have only just uh, a few days or few decades uh, with the minus temperature and otherwise we have uh, uh, warmer winter and short, shorter winter uh, and also this is uh, the reason for uh, water using uh, period in, in, in Uzbekistan and you see rainfall uh, annual is uh, 254 uh, millimeters and uh, and also as you have seen the, we divided to the northwest and mountain and middle uh, areas and uh, the rainfall also uh, very different and it, you know that means uh, we are dependent on the rainfall and uh, the climate change uh, so um, last maybe uh, 10 and 15 years uh, our climate is uh, changing too fast even today today in Samarkand we have uh, you know the very short uh, but very hard uh, rain but for 10 20 days or 30 days uh, we have no water no rain and, uh, and very dry and hot temperature. For example, a couple of days ago, it was uh, 37 degrees plus up, uh, you know, the zero. It means, you know, the, for this time, I mean, the April, it is too hot. And uh, it means the climate is uh, changing. Uh, it is because of the global climate change, but, um, the local also we have climate change like uh, we are uh, losing RLC and uh, we have an also local climate change. Um, okay, we have talked about uh, the geographical uh, locations and how we deal with the, with the neighboring countries because we share you know the existing water resources with with sh we share with the uh, neighboring Central Asian countries. And on this slide, you see uh, how uh, uh, the numbers are different with the uh, water withdrawal and water formation and water use. And I would like to make your uh, main attention to Uzbekistan and Uzbekistan is uh, uh, the biggest by uh, population in Central Asia but uh, but uh, mm, water formation only around 10% uh, among of the all, all of the Central Asian region and we use you know the per year uh, almost uh, 60 cubic kilometers per year and it is almost half of the existing all water resources and it it makes a huge uh, water shortage and water uh, problems in in our uh, Uzbekistan and um, if we see for example Kazakhstan and Kazakhstan's area is uh, one of the hugest and also in the, in the Asian, but in Central Asia is the, the biggest one. And, uh, but uh, you see their uh, water using, water using is uh, only 2% uh, 
from the uh, the you know the all of the existing of the resources uh, because uh, they use uh, water mainly for industry and um, for uh, municipal but not too much for the irrigation uh, now we have to uh, show uh, you know the the water flow through the uh, neighboring countries and of of course um, through the Uzbekistan and you see the, we share for example Amudarya is uh, like transboundary river and we share uh, Tajikistan uh, uh, Afghanistan uh, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan so four uh, countries if we just look to the map you know the Water formation in the initial points also, you know, the goes to the China side. Uh, if we see the Sardaria, and we share this with the Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan, uh, and later, um, you know, the um, last week we have seen the uh, other presentations about Aral Sea situation. It is now uh, divided into two uh, lakes. Uh, we call this like uh, Northern Aral Lake and Southern Aral Lake. And the situation gets much better in the Northern part, we is uh, Kazakhstan and we um, share, you know, the Serdarya. So Serdarya flows into the Northern part. And Kyrgyzstan, Okay, let's uh, start from Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan is uh, not too much um, uh, um, agrar country because this is a mountain place, so they uh, don't use for almost don't use for irrigation, and uh, only small part of Uzbekistan I mentioned in the beginning, like uh, Fergana Valley and uh, we use from Serdaria for irrigation. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, Kazakhstan doesn't use too much for irrigation. What it means? It means uh, uh, from Serdaria side, water flow inflow to the Northern part of Aral Sea uh, is much uh, easier and much uh, uh, better. So, um, uh, I would like to make your attention for which purposes we use uh, water in Uzbekistan and you see uh, almost 85% uh, you know the goes to the rural economy. It is to the uh, irrigation and it is uh, mainly for uh, cotton and, uh, and the weight, weight uh, e uh, economy. And you see, uh, we use uh, only 12% for industry and only 3% for the municipal services. And municipalities, I mean, the urban areas, uh, we use um, not too much water if we compare with the other industries. Uh, in the beginning, uh, in the first part, and the, uh, the question was, I mean, the question from the uh, professor uh, Rush Reden was how much water we pay uh, for the everyday, you know, the uh, communal using or municipal using municipal services, uh, and it is uh, if you compare with the you know the other purposes, it is not too uh, much. It is almost almost. Uh, free or um, uh, this is um, uh, industry or uh, rural economy uh, uses much bigger water so the, the key point is a rural economy if we use more water saving technology then we could use much you know the faster and bigger amount of waters of course we have to make attention to the municipal uh, water using and industrials also and um, uh, the rural economy always depends on the climate and our climate is uh, as i mentioned it is uh, 
uh, dry and hot and uh, longer uh, uh, summer uh, period and uh, shorter winter it also makes uh, you know the the, the uh, uh, losing water for the evaporation and also open irrigation. Uh, I have to tell you, you know, the openly that uh, we don't use too much uh, water saving technologies. If you see uh, how what we use uh, water and how it looks like if we compare with the modern uh, water using technologies, and you see in the rural areas, it's, uh, you know, the Professor Redden mentioned, uh, is the, the, you know, the toilets are open when we are used or are they closed when we stopped using water and toilet? Let's just look, you know, the, to the drinking water situations and drinking water, you know, the, of course, this is very important because it's related to the human health and uh, our system. Of course, it gets uh, uh, slowly, it gets, uh, you know, uh, modified, but still uh, mainly, you know, in the rural areas, uh, the drinking water using system is, uh, uh, doesn't uh, uh, meet, you know, the official, regulations or official codes so uh, and uh, sometimes we are happy if we have just next to our house uh, you know the centralized uh, piping water uh, supply system and some places they have even not uh, drinking water supply system and then you use you know the water if you see on these pictures you know there's some uh, uh, some bottles or some kettles or something to bring drinking water from uh, from the uh, big distance. Even, you know, the, the picture shows that the girl is uh, laughing, but she is not happy. I'm, I'm pretty sure she is not happy with the drinking water. Um, and also uh, communal water using, and we use... Uh, uh, not always, you know, the clean water and drinking water system, uh, as I mentioned, uh, they, they need uh, uh, to be uh, improved because uh, uh, groundwaters, uh, you see this kind of device, uh, de device and this device, you know, the, gets, you know, the, from the not too uh, deep uh, water source and this is only almost, uh, let's say, around 10 meters, maybe 10, 12 meters. And that water is uh, just, you know, the contaminated from irrigation places, from uh, canals or from some open, uh, you know, the water reservoirs. And, and you see in the beginning, I'm sorry, uh, I was mentioned, you know, the we use too much water for irrigation and of course cotton plantations in agriculture and of course we use uh, still we use uh, some kind of uh, chemicals and uh, uh, we stopped of course uh, using uh, too much uh, chemicals because they are uh, not too uh, uh, less, they are not very expensive, uh, but uh, still, you know, the farming system, they use uh, the chemicals and pesticides and the herbicides sometimes, and it goes with the, you know, the, with the irrigation uh, canals or just, you know, the, the some uh, small industry, they, they dam the water to the open canals and you have seen uh, you know the, the oh this picture and it goes you know the with the filtration to the the very um, uh, the the first uh, layer of the aquifer and we call this you know the contaminated water and this is the main issue for uh, for the um, health situation in Uzbekistan. 
health situation and uh, contamination, um, water uh, are also shrinking. Uh, they are related to each other. And of course, these pictures are taken from, from the uh, uh, space. And uh, uh, you see the difference between, you know, the 1960s and nowadays. As I mentioned, this one is like Northern um, Aral Lake, and this is a Southern Aral Lake, and other places, you, you see the, the original shore, uh, it was like this, and now is a million hectares, you know, the, the Aral Sea, uh, Aral Kum, we call it. Mm -hmm. desert, Aral Kum desert. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, this makes you know the you know, huge uh, uh, problems with uh, uh, with the health situation. I'm not going too much deep to to uh, this <coughs> island because uh, Abdul, island... I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you have to start summing up because time is out practically. Oh, so okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, summarizing is. Uh, uh, about uh, sustainable water resources management and uh, how we can sustain, uh, you know, the water resources uh, using in, in uh, Central Asia. Uh, I just was uh, too much deep how we use, but uh, my conclusion is how we have to use. Uh, then, um, you know, this graph shows how the, the population number is rising, I mean, water demand, and uh, how water is a, a renewable water resource, but still, you know, the, the uh, clean water, I mean, the uh, usable water resources are getting less than I offer, I mean, the, I offer to using, you know, the uh, more uh, deeper clean groundwaters, because um, I have to show one, one slide and this slide uh, is very informative, you know, the Sardaria, Modaria, and this part is, uh, you know, the groundwaters, almost half like, uh, and we, we have a good resource for this, but the, the quality, the quality of the groundwater is not always is good, but still uh, this is possible. Uh, I mean, the, the sustainable uh, using of the uh, groundwaters are one of the solution to sustain this uh, water uh, situation in Central Asia. Uh, my uh, uh, my uh, presentation will be continued uh, uh, also next week, and uh, I am uh, planning, you know, to talk about uh, groundwater using technologies and uh, what is the situation and how we can, can uh, you know, the replace, uh, you know, the water using from the surface into uh, groundwaters. And uh, for now, uh, the question for the two questions for uh, our students, and one is what is the, the main water problem in Uzbekistan? Maybe you may just think about Central Asia, uh, but uh, you have to think about uh, the main uh, reason. And the next is how do you think about uh, a proper water? Uh, problem solution in Uzbekistan and Central Asia. For today, it is, I think it is uh, enough. I'm sorry if I was out of the water, I mean, uh, time limit, but uh, the... Uh, mm. So thank you very we'll much. Be, we'll be thank you very much. It's, you. It's, oh. it's not too bad since you were able to sum up very quickly. Yes. So thank you. It's um, um, of course all these slides will be available on the uh, homepage of the course. So and there there is a lot of information on them. So that's uh, possible to go back and and look at it. And Christian will uh, do that if you send the presentation to him. Please do. Yes. Yes. Um, yes of course. We will. will 
uh, we will meet in a, an hour. Let's say for us, it's 14. For you, I think it's 17 mm -hmm. hours. And uh, it's just a few minutes. Let's say 17 exactly. And I hope there will be a couple of presentations um, from students then.